My name uh, is Steve Bromage, uh, Executive Director of Maine Historical Society, and I want to welcome you to all what's going to be a, a fascinating program tonight about the, the Brown family. Thank you so much for joining us and for your continued support for MHS as members of our 1822 Leadership Circle. Support is really ma what makes everything that MHS does possible. I also want to welcome friends from the Thornhurst neighborhood uh, and to thank Debbie Reed and Jean Gulliver for their incredible ongoing leadership at Maine Historical Society. They have both helped so make so much happen here. I hope you're all continuing to endure the pandemic. What a challenging bicentennial year we've had. It's not getting any easier, but perhaps improvements are in sight as we head into 2021. MHS has been challenged by the pandemic like everyone else. We are hustling to replace lost revenue from admissions, cancellation of events and other sources. But I'm also incredibly proud of the way the staff board and the organization as a whole has responded and our ability to continue to do really powerful, uh, important work and maintain our momentum. Uh, one of our top strategic pr priorities has been to find better ways to serve people across the state and country who love Maine but can't visit our campus in Portland regularly. The immediate and widespread adoption of Zoom this year has given MHS an incredible platform to connect with and provide programming to people regardless of where they live. This year, we have nearly triple participation in our public programs, thanks to Zoom, from approximately 1,000 people in 2019 to nearly 3,000 so far this year. All of these programs, too, are available online on our website for viewing at your convenience, MHS On Demand. Um, so programs delivered via Zoom will be a cornerstone for MHS going forward. We're really excited about those possibilities. I also want to remind you that we have three excellent avail exhibitions available for safe viewing in our gallery between now and the end of the year. State of Mind, Becoming Maine, our bicentennial exhibit. Redact, which ex explores the redaction of Maine constitution and its impact on the Wabanaki community. And A Convenient Soldier, The Black Guards of Maine. Those have all gotten some great press. And our Maine at 200 program series will continue through March, including great speakers like Colin Woodard. We appreciate keep your keeping MHS in mind and as a priority as you consider your year end giving. We really do appreciate that. So on to the Brown family. Few families have had such an impact on Portland's growth and development as the Browns. And JB Brown, JB Brown and Sons continues to re remain a very important leader in the community. MHS's research library is, of course, uh, named for John Marshall and Elida Carroll Brown, who you will hear about this evening. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Jamie Rice, MHS's Director of Collections and Research, who knows the Brown stories like few other people. Uh, thank you very much. And so I think everyone can see the slide here. So as mentioned, I'm Jamie Rice. I'm the Director of Collections and Research at Maine Historical Society. And I'm also the archivist for the John Marshall Brown papers. So uh, in 2004, when I was a graduate intern at Maine Historical Society, I got the opportunity to work as a processing archivist for the Brown papers that were donated by Larni Otis. And, and they came with some resources to hire an archivist. And so it was my first professional job as a librarian archivist. And so I really connected with the collection, I think on a lot of different levels. And you know, sometimes when you work in my field, you just meet some people on paper that you really uh, identify with. And, and I would say that that's the case with, with John Marshall Brown. I shared a lot of the same interests with him and you know, he fought in the Civil War, which was of great interest to me. It was really a way for me to learn Portland history, which I, I didn't really know when I started at Maine Historical or Maine history for that matter. Um, and um, we, there's a Maryland contingency and I'm originally from Maryland. Uh, John Marshall Brown and I even have the same birthday about 137 years apart. But nonetheless, I really connected with the collection and I spent way too much time with it. I probably made like $1.50 an hour, but at the end of it, I got to really know the family in, in a unique way. And I've continued to work with the collection for the last 15 plus years. And so this is a great opportunity to kind of share what I've learned and what I think I know about the family. But I would encourage anyone if I uh, leave something out or, well, there's a lot to cover, I'm sure I'll leave something out. But if I get anything wrong or you have some stories 
where you have photographs. I'd be very interested in hearing more about them. So uh, with that, I'm going to kind of share um, an overview of about three generations of the Brown family. And that is, uh, you know, give or take, maybe a generation before, maybe a generation after, but largely the children of John Bundy Brown. And um, that kind of uh, deals with the three generations there as they came to Portland and sort of their connection with Portland. Uh, the Princes of Portland is the title of the program. And that is a nickname that was given to John Bundy Brown's children when they were, um, you know, when they were out and about. And, you know, in some ways you could say that, you know, maybe it was a nickname kind of speaking to their, to their privilege or to the situation. But I also think it really spoke to sort of this 19th century aristocracy that was kind of created in this time. You see a lot of families like the Browns, like the Paysons, like the Deerings, like the Thomases or the Claps. And you kind of have like this society that was kind of centralized around this, um, this kind of Portland nobility, if it were. And so I think it really speaks to that and really kind of captures you know, the position and the responsibility of stewarding the city forward, especially after the fire of 1866. And so tonight's talk will kind of focus around Bram Hall and Thornhurst and really the people who lived at those, maybe less about the architecture and the buildings themselves, but more about the people who lived in these places. And I think that's probably a good moment to pause and say, Bram Hall and Thornhurst are but a chapter in the history of what is now the West End or Falmouth Foreside, you know, starting as Wabanaki homeland and, uh, you know, engaging in all sorts of activity during a very kind of violent colonial period and evolving into what we today now know as the West End and, um, and the Thornhurst area of Falmouth Foreside. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started and we'll start with the patriarch himself, which is John Bundy Brown. So uh, John Bundy Brown was born in May of 1805. Some records say 1804. I've never been able to find a proper birth certificate, but that's to be expected in New Hampshire in the 1800s. But uh, we'll stick with 1805. Uh, he was the son of Titus Olcott Brown and Susanna Bundy. And that's his father there. Uh, Titus Olcott Brown was originally from Tolland, Connecticut. He was the son of Elias Brown and Abigail Olcott. Uh, the Brown line is descended, specifically this line is descended from Thomas Brown, who emigrated to Massachusetts from England in 1628. But the next generation took the family to Connecticut, which I think they're a little more historically associated with. Uh, Titus Olcott Brown moved from Tolland, Connecticut to New Hampshire, where John Bundy Brown was born, and then eventually to Gray, Maine, um, where he operated a, a stage tavern and you know, sort of a tavern slash hotel for about 20 years before he moved to Norway. This here says that it's the Elm House, but um, it's, that was the name for it when this postcard was created, but um, it's, you know, it's a, a historic home in, um, in Gray. So he eventually moves to Norway and that Norway area is where you see a lot of John Bundy Brown's siblings sort of establish themselves in that sort of South Paris, Norway area. Uh, Titus also ran a tavern in Norway and then he died there in 1855. Uh, he married Susanna Bundy um, in 1794. She was the daughter of Isaac Bundy, who was a patriot in the American Revolution and Susanna Johnson of Walpole, New Hampshire. Uh, this Bundy, li Bundy line is descended from the immigrant John Bundy, who uh, emigrated to Plymouth in 1630 as part of the Pilgrim Brewster kind of contingency and was a veteran of the colonial wars. Uh, Titus and Susanna Brown had 10 children and John Bundy Brown kind of fit right there in the middle. Uh, an entrepreneurial spirit was really kind of prevalent in John Bundy Brown early on. He was very interested in getting out of Gray, Maine, and he secured himself an apprenticeship in 1825 at the age of 19 with Althea Shaw, who ran a successful grocery here in Portland. Here's a letter that we have in the collections at Maine Historical Society that reads, Mr. T. O. Brown, uh, Portland, April, 1825. Sir, if your son will come with, um, with, uh, with me and room on the ninth day of May and remain, if we could both be suited until he's 21 years of age and I will board him and give you, that's his father, $60 for his service. 
So Titus Olcott Brown got paid for John Bundy Brown's service and he makes his way to Portland. He doesn't stay with Althea Shaw very long. Actually him and his fellow apprentice at Shaw's um, named Sinjin Smith, they uh, form a business called Smith and Brown and that is on um, operating near Market Square. So you can see that in the center. And then we have John Bundy Brown on the side. That is not him at the age of 21, obviously, but it's about as young as the photos here are gonna get. So uh, they first were at Market, um, Market Square, which is probably technically like Monument Square today. And then eventually John Bundy Brown kind of breaks out on his own and forms a, uh, a business on 4th Street, sort of at the kind of the Eastern part of 4th Street at 246 for at that time. By the mid 1840s, uh, Brown formed J.B. Brown and Company with Jedediah Jewett and Mark Emery. And then he started to diversify into real estate. So in 1855, um, or excuse me, in the 1840s, he starts to get into the sugar business um, as um, he gets, um, he's, he's backed by one of his wife's brothers, Philip Greeley, who's operating a Boston business called Greeley and Guild. And they wanna really tap into the Portland sugar market. So Portland, importing molasses into the port of Portland is already big business at this time. And so John Bunny Brown gets the backers, but then his backers quickly go belly up. And so he really needs to kind of take out on his own. And um, he does so by partnering up with a man named D.H. Furbish. And they start to headhunt guys in New York. These, you know, there's a lot of Irishmen in New York who are really savvy at kind of refining sugar. They go and they headhunt and they bring them back to Portland and they really establish what we today know as the Portland Sugar Company. So in 1855, Portland Sugar Company is formed uh, with several investors, including his oldest son, Philip Henry Brown. Uh, the, he, they also form a new firm called J.B. Brown and Son, and then it becomes J.B. Brown and Sons uh, when the, um, Philip's younger brother, James, joins the firm in 1859. So the Portland Sugar Company was noted as the third largest American sugar refinery in the period. You know, it's the success of the Portland Sugar Company is complex for a variety of reasons, but it's a specifically complex in Portland history for two, at least I think, two specific reasons. One is that, you know, sugar and cotton are the two most prolific um, commodities in the Atlantic slave economy. And you're starting to see a lot of uh, anti-slavery and uh, abolitionism kind of building in Portland, you know, in the 1830s, in the 1840s, and by the 1850s, when when the Portland Sugar Company is sort of at its peak, when Portland sugar is at its peak, and sort of it's juxtaposed with this sentiment. But also, this is at the same time where you're seeing a really large movement of um, temperance and you know, in molasses, which is what's being imported from the West Indies at this time, from the from the slave plantations in West the West Indies, um, is a is the major ingredient in rum, and is a lot of what this is being used for is the manufacturing of alcohol. At the same time that the sugar is, um, the temperance is kind of taking root. So it's a very interesting dynamic that's kind of worthy of someone's dissertation, but uh, you know, it's it's interesting nonetheless. So, you know, they're importing sugar from the West Indies, specifically Cuba. And, you know, this is a painting we have in the collections of that production in Cuba. And the sugar, um, you know, they're finding real success uh, in this. You know, we, Maine Historical Society plans to kind of explore the complex relationship with the Portland maritime economy, Maine's maritime economy, and the slave economy in our upcoming exhibition for 2021. Uh, but it is an, an interesting um, uh, complexity. To that. So around this time when the sugar, when sugar business is booming, uh, John Bundy Brown commissions Bram Hall, which was a palatial estate up on the West End and sort of the, you know, the central kind of focus um, of tonight's program or the people associated with Bram Hall. It was designed by Charles Alexander, who was a favorite architect of Brown's and really built between 1855 and 1858. Uh, Brown had started to diversify into real estate and railroads, which honestly is really what saves him financially after the sugar company burns. But in the same period, he um, starts to um, 
to, to build his estate. So he's really buying a lot of the land on the Western Prom to kind of break up uh, for uh, real estate purposes, but also to create this um, pretty palatial home. So uh, during the 1850s, uh, the Western Prom, as what we would consider today, was really unusable, kind of swamp-like land. Um, there were a few, as they called them, quote, shacks that they referred to the people of the day referred to as Hogville, which I think is probably because of the proximity to the slaughterhouses on modern Thompson's Point, but I can't really find any support for that. Uh, he, uh, Brown chose a 10-acre lot um, in that area. And Bill Berry, Maine Historicals Bill Berry, wrote a great article in the Portland Monthly Magazine in 1995, where he says, and I quote, uh, Brown had originally dreamed of a mansion on the knoll off Brighton Avenue opposite Fessenden Park, but that lot was not available and Hogville became the object of interest. Brown chose a 10-acre oblong lot bounded by the, what's today would be the Promenade, Bowdoin, Vaughan, Pine, and Carroll Streets. Uh, J.B. Brown and his family also purchased numerous surrounding lots in the 1870s. And you'll sort of see this pattern later with Thornhurst and John Marshall Brown, where it's just buying little pieces of land, well, not little, but little pieces of land and kind of consolidating those, building a large estate, and then breaking down the estate and selling off the pieces of land to create these neighborhoods. Uh, so the land, which as I mentioned, was which was situated on Wabanaki homeland and was the really the subject of much violent conflict. And it's from that period that it gets that the house gets its name in Bram Hall. It's named for George Bram Hall, who was a veteran of the colonial wars and uh, specifically the Battle of, um, of Anthony Brackett's farm, which is down in the, in the Deering Oaks area in which he was killed. And so he's kind of takes that Bram Hall's Hill takes its name from that George Bram Hall, so his colonial figure. So it does kind of evoke back to that period of much violence and, and strife and, and really a very sensitive aspect for uh, the Wabanaki uh, tribes and the relationship to Portland. So here's kind of a map that you'll see uh, a little bit. I know the 69 area is really what Bram Hall is and you can see that kind of like a long rectangle that's sort of in the middle of the plot, that's Bram Hall and the palatial gardens are behind it. And there were some orchards. And if you can kind of notice that there's Bowdoin Street sort of down kind of, you know, kind of cuts along the side. And a lot of the houses you'll see later in the presentation are sort of on that Bram Hall side of Bowdoin Street where he's kind of breaking off little pieces of that. And so this map is kind of useful to kind of get your bearings about what it looks like. And this particular map is from 1882. So um, before the family lived in Bram Hall, they lived at this house in the corner of Spring and Oak. This is where all the Brown, well, John Bundy Brown and Anne Greeley's children were born. John Marshall Brown, uh, who's, who's really the other central figure in the story because of the connection that I have to the, his collection. And obviously the library is named for that. That, um, you know, I, his bedroom, I think, was up on the top right, sort of faced the ocean, but this uh, particular home sort of stayed in the family until they finally moved to Bram Hall. But by that time, some of his children were already out of the house. So uh, uh, John Bundy Brown commissioned New York and Boston-based architect Charles Alexander to build the home. And uh, the house featured a number of um, interesting uh, components, a greenhouse, you can see it's an Italianate structure, sort of a stucco over brick kind of facade. And uh, the home here, you can see some other photographs that we have, you know, kind of some step back, kind of you can see the greenhouse on the piece here. And then here is a little snippet. I like to thank Earl Shuttleworth for lending me these photographs, some of which we have in the collections and other we do not. I've never seen floor plans. So I'd love to know where this one came from, but you can see that there was an art gallery in the space, which is really kind of a, you know, an early precursor to that like salon style, New York gilded age where people could be invited into your home to view your artworks that you would have on display. But there was public access to this gallery and really could be considered one of Portland's first galleries. Um, in the newspaper, they called it the first properly lighted room in Portland for the hanging of pictures, which uh, is, it has an interesting component. Brown traveled extensively in Europe, especially in 1860 collecting, but he was also a really large patron of regional artists, especially local artists. 
Unfortunately, uh, I don't know of a comprehensive listing of his uh, pieces. There was an exhibition with the Portland Society of Art in 1923 that included pieces on loan from family members. Uh, unfortunately, the catalog is um, lists the people who lent them, but not necessarily the artist, just the titles of the pieces. So it's a little complicated to kind of hear, but this particular one we do know belonged to uh, J.B. Brown. It's called The Cheat Detected, which is by a British artist who actually lived in Portland named Elizabeth uh, Murray. So uh, Bram Hall, um, uh, here you can see the greenhouse. It had palatial gardens, uh, some of the best arranged and most neatly kept garden grounds. The gardener Patrick Duffy received multiple awards from the Portland Horticultural Society. And it really kind of spoke to his children's interest in plants. Both his son, Philip, and his daughter, Ellen, were very interested in flowers and plantings. And John Marshall Brown often wrote back to his siblings during the war about how he would like to try to get these plants from the South and send them back, but wasn't, wasn't very fruitful. As some palmetto trees from South Carolina that didn't quite make it. So to quote Bill Berry again, Bram Hall would have rivaled the Victoria mansion of the 19th century's greatest example of regional conspicuous consumption. Uh, its last hurrah was in 1908. So in 1901, uh, when John Bunny Brown's wife died, the house was really vacated. And in 1908, years after the family moved out, the empty mansion was converted to a banquet hall. Uh, it hosted the apple blossom tea, which was for the benefit of tuberculosis charities. Uh, it was hosted by members of the family, including Helen Brown Holt and Annie Brown True, uh, who were uh, John Bundy Brown's uh, granddaughters and his son, Philip. So here we have John Bundy Brown and Anne Matilda Greeley. Uh, that uh, he married Anne Matilda in North Yar of North Yarmouth, really of Cumberland, but at the time it was North Yarmouth, in 1830. Anne Matilda Greeley was the daughter of Philip Greeley and Dorcas Blanchard and the granddaughter of Eliathic Greeley and Sarah Prince. So it's a lot of really um, prolific Cumberland names, Prince and Blanchard and Greeley. Um, and so they, uh, she came from a very large family. She was the oldest of 11 children, including the Philip Greeley, who was responsible for getting John Bundy Brown into the sugar business. According to their great grandson, Charles Shipman Payson, John Bundy Brown first laid eyes on young Anne when he came to town at the age of 14 delivering a, a, a load of hardwoods. But um, I haven't seen any documentation for that, but it'd be kind of hard to, to have that anyway. Uh, John Bundy Brown and Anne Matilda Greeley had five children in total, um, all of which were born while living at the Spring Street house. They had Philip, who you can see in the top left, um, Matilda, who unfortunately died young when she was two, uh, James, who's at the top right, John, the bottom left, and Ellen, uh, in that order. So John Bundy Brown lived until 1881. Uh, he died after a fall on the ice when he was walking home from his, um, his daughter Ellen's house. Uh, Anne, his wife, uh, lived until uh, 1901, and at that's what time the Bram Hall was, um, was vacated. So here's just another photograph of John Bunny Brown and, and Matilda Greeley, probably the most common photographs that you see. There's really two common photographs of John Bunny Brown. There's John Bunny Brown with the fur and John Bunny Brown with the tuxedo. Those are really the black tie John Bunny Brown, really the two that you see the most of. And this is a pretty, uh, a pretty common photograph of his wife. So we'll move on to the princes of Portland. And I will use princes in the non-gender specific term and include Ellen in, the, in this as well. Although I will admit she's probably the, the, uh, the sibling that I know the least about. Um, Philip Henry Brown is the oldest of uh, John Bundy and Anne Matilda Greeley's children. Uh, he firmly carried forth his father's business legacy. He was born in 1831. He was educated at Portland Academy and Bowdoin College. It's the class of 1851. And he also had a degree from the Lawrence Scientific School at Harvard in chemistry, which you can imagine was pretty useful in the sugar business. So um, he joined his father's business firm, J.B. Brown and Son, which would become Sons shortly thereafter when his brother joined the firm. He was also part of the short-lived Churchill, Browns and Manson, which was like a logistical firm that um, was really kind of responsible for the transportation of the sugar. Churchill, I think his name was James, but Churchill was sort of responsible for 
the ships themselves and the Browns, mostly Philip, was responsible for the warehousing. So they really kind of did the kind of the dry goods component um, when, when here or the importation of molasses, sort of the storing of that. Uh, he partnered with his younger brother, John Marshall Brown, eventually to form P.H. and J.M. Brown, which also dealt, dealt in real estate. Um, and he was very successful in business, certainly took after his father in that respect. He was president of a number of Portland businesses, um, railroad companies, utility companies, board of trade, just, just very successful in business, uh, and including the in, you know, stewarding the family firms forward. He was also active in social organizations. He was treasurer of the Maine Historical Society. He was treasurer of the Longfellow Statue Association and uh, the Portland Society of Art, Soldiers and Sailors Monuments. And he was an avid supporter of Bowdoin College. Um, he and his uh, brother, John Marshall Brown were instrumental in the establishment of the Falmouth Hotel, which um, you know, with, through, the, through the stewardship of their father, but were really kind of on the ground, more um, very involved in the establishment of the Falmouth Hotel, which was a, a grand hotel of 200 plus rooms, which is kind of in that kind of key bank. I don't know if anyone has seen, there's like a new kind of vegan restaurant right in that little area there in Portland, but that, that's the area that the Falmouth Hotel was in. And this is a picture shortly after it opened. It served as the Republic, main Republican headquarters for a while. It, Roosevelt stayed there, Taft stayed there. It was really quite, uh, quite a grand place. Um, and uh, here's a complimentary dinner pamphlet that we have with a menu, which is right after its, uh, its opening from 1868. Uh, Brown was also an, an amateur photographer. Uh, he traveled around the city taking photographs and he contributed to the Portland Advertiser newspaper with these kind of like jaunts that he would do. And there's this one that I think is really interesting where he writes about how terrible it is to drive on what, well, to ride on Washington Avenue and how everyone should avoid what was Washington Street at the time. But how everyone should avoid that by going around the, the bay, going around the cove. And that's how four siders should get home. They should never try to go on Washington Ave. So not much has changed. I happen to live off Washington Ave, so I'm well aware. But um, he was, um, and these continue to be published after his death. You can see the clippings, which is in his brother's handwriting from 1901. Uh, they were continually published. And they weren't disparaging. I think they're mostly about people kind of learning about their city and seeing the sites and kind of what to see. And so he, he, um, he wrote a lot of articles for that. Um, an interesting bit of history that I'll mention is that there's some records at the Maine State Archives that indicate that Philip Henry Brown was a um, soldier in the Civil War, but he was not. Uh, he considered that to be one of his regrets, but he was pretty entrenched in the family business. And when his brother joined the army, there was only really one that was going to go. Um, but for some reason, he's been attributed to the 27th Maine in, uh, Infantry, which is uh, notorious for getting... Um, a, like an 800 plus uh, Medal of Honor for staying on in Washington and then they were revoked during World War I. And so it's, it's quite, a, quite a really interesting story, but this is not him. So uh, those references are, are incorrect. And I think someone might have even given him a star at his grave, but that is incorrect. All right. So he married uh, Fanny Clifford, uh, Frances Clifford. She was uh, in 1854. Uh, the couple had six children, Philip Greeley, Nathan Clifford, Fanny Clifford, Annie Ellen, John Clifford, and Helen Clifford Brown. The family first lived at the corner of Oak and Pleasant, which is here, um, at, uh, and then, then built a home at 85, this is actually 85 Bond Street, which is where the, the family lived from then on out. Uh, it has a different address of 11 Bowden Street, I think it depends on the access point. It no longer stands. Uh, Fanny Clifford um, was originally from Newfield. She's the daughter of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Nathan Clifford and Hannah Eyre. Both she and her brother William married into the Brown family. Uh, Fanny was very close to her children, several of which lived in the family home until she died in 1900. Uh, the six children include Philip Greeley Brown. Unfortunately, I do not have a picture of Philip Greeley Brown, but these are one of his photographs that he was also an amateur photographer and his book plate. He was an avid book collector. Um, he um, had an extensive library that was uh, auctioned off after his death in 1936, included uh, several first editions, uh, and Maine Historical Society really benefited from his generosity. Uh, this book plate is actually from a first edition 
of uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin that we have here in the collections. Um, he lived, he never married and he lived at the family home uh, until his death and uh, was also uh, involved in the family business. He worked at J.B. Brown and Sons and the P.H. and J.M. Brown uh, and really kind of took on that legacy from his father in the, in the business sense. Um, I also find it really interesting that his handwriting is almost exactly like his uncle's, but it's sort of just a strange observation. Uh, his brother, Nathan Clifford Brown, um, was uh, an ornithologist. He went by the nickname of Cliff. Uh, he attended Bowdoin like his brother. They both graduated in 1877, the class of 1877. They were kind of like Irish twins. Um, he's most known for his works, The Birds of New England and Adjacent States, Catalog of Birds of Portland and Vicinity, and his work on Birds of Alabama, which is an interesting aspect. He practiced taxidermy. He studied under American naturalist Charles J Johnson Maynard and was a friend of explorer Robert Perry's. They um, practiced taxidermy together. Uh, he married Florence Cornelia Pell in New York while in, living in Paris in 1887. They had one child named Cornelia. Uh, they had kind of a messy divorce. Um, there was a lot of accusations and abuse and uh, he lost custody of his daughter and he moved back to Portland. Um, uh, his ex-wife made national news when she dared to try to use her maiden name when she opened a business and her family felt it was spite work. And so there was a, a lot of a scandal on that as well. Um, both she and him both remarried. Um, Nathan and his wife, Susanna, then lived in Portland. And there's a couple different houses in the West End referred to as the Nathan Clifford Brown houses um, of the All the Landmarks Registry. Uh, this is Frances Clifford Brown, she's known as Fanny. Uh, she was their third child and oldest daughter. She was educated at Miss Simon's school. She married Lindsay Prescott uh, of Boston uh, in Portland in 1887. Uh, Lindsay was a descendant of William Prescott, who's a Bunker Hill patriot. Uh, the couple lived in Boston and they had four children, William, Edith, Francis, and Augusta. Uh, the family traveled extensively. Uh, Lindsay worked in cotton manufacturing and uh, Fanny was involved in social organizations like the Women's Municipal League. Uh, two of their daughters served overseas. One is actually a, was a yeoman in, in World War I uh, in the US Navy and the other in the YMC canteens in Europe. This is Annie Ellen Brown. She was born in 1860. She was also educated at Miss Simons. She married Frank Daniel True and the True family um, you know, is, is, is pretty connected with the different homes on the West End and the, for the Bram Hall neighborhood. Um, he was a wholesale grocer and a member of the Maine Historical Society and Maine Genealogical Society, a pretty active member. Uh, they were involved in lots of different charitable organizations. They lived at 113 um, Bond Street, which is, I'll talk about later, it was known as the John Marshall Brown House. And the couple had four children, uh, Dorothy, Daniel, who moved out to Montana, Annie, who married William McCandless, and Mary, who predeceased her parents. And uh, they also had a farm out in Mechanic Falls, I think. And then here is uh, John Clifford Brown, known as Jack. Uh, his experience is, this is a pretty sad story. He uh, was a bit of an adventurer. He, um, he joined the army and during the Spanish-American War, I was pretty disappointed that his, as an officer, he wasn't deployed to Cuba. And so when his enlistment was up, he re-enlisted as a private, uh, despite his parents' wishes. Um, and uh, he came, came, was, got quite sick from typhoid in 1900 out in California. Um, Helen Brown, his younger sister, um, traveled with her mother Fanny out to San Francisco to see. And there's a book called Gentleman Soldier, which was um, written by Joseph McCallis, uh, what's well, actually John Clifford Brown's journals, but it's, it's compiled by, by Mr. McCallis. And, and uh, there's a really uh, poignant section that talks about the last days of both uh, the mother and the brother. So Mrs. Holt, who's Helen, was by then was Mrs. Holt, was then 24 and single and by her own admission sheltered from the responsibilities of independence. She traveled across the country with her mother to visit her dying brother. Two women making such a journey unaccompanied at the time was no trivial undertaking. Yet uh, they, um, they were hoping to provide some some solace to the desperately ill young man. Uh, tragically, um, her mother came down with a cold on the way and actually died in the in deathbed alongside her dying son. Uh, he shortly died, maybe about a month and a half later, both of them in San Francisco. And so it's a really kind of, it's a tragic story. Uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting book if those of you who might be interested in that. 
So Helen, uh, um, she actually came back to Maine um, and she married uh, Benjamin Holt. Um, oh, excuse me, she married Harrison Holt, not to be confused with Benjamin Holt. She married Harrison Holt, a graduate of Harvard and also a veteran of the Spanish-American War. So here's another picture of John. Uh, this one's really great, it's at Thornhurst and it says that he just drank 15 glasses of lemonade, which I'm not sure why that was important, but clearly 15 glasses of lemonade. Uh, Helen came back um, and lived at the house at 55 Bowdoin Street. Um, and uh, the couple had three daughters, Helen, Julia, and Frances, all of which. So we're on to the second child, which is James Olcott Brown. This is John Bundy Brown's second son, and by all accounts, his favorite. He was interested in the humanities, education, and literary pursuits. He was a poet. Um, much of his papers that are at Maine Historical Society are his writings. He was also educated at Bowdoin, the class of 1856. Uh, he married uh, Emily Kimball Oliver of Massachusetts, the daughter of Henry Kimball Oliver and Sarah Cook. Uh, they married in Lawrence, Mass, and then they lived at 14 Bowdoin Street. So there's Emily. And here's their house at 14 Bowdoin, which still stands, the James Olcott Brown house. And this is their daughter, Matilda, that's over on the far left. Um, uh, unfortunately, James died very young. He was 24 um, and he had diphtheria. Uh, John Bundy Brown was devastated by his son's death and actually established two scholarships in his honor, one at Bowdoin College and one at Portland High School as the Brown Memorial Medal, which you can see a, a one here. Um, the Portland High School is still given out. It was, until recently, it was given out to five boys and five girls, but I think that they entered the gender specific nature of it just last year. And the Bowdoin scholarship was for a Portland High School graduate that was attending Bowdoin and one was given out to each class. Uh, Matilda, uh, who was James's daughter, really kind of stood in as his heir. John Bundy Brown continued as her guardian. And um, unfortunately, she died at the age of 19 while living in, um, in Newport. Her mother had remarried uh, a General George Andrews. The family moved to Texas and then eventually to Rhode Island where, um, where Matilda died. Uh, John Bundy Brown was devastated when she died and, and actually he died about four months later. Um, some, the, some of the family story said that he died of a broken heart. So I'm gonna skip a little out of order. This is Ellen Greeley Brown. She's the daughter and the youngest child of John Marshall Brown, oh, excuse me, John Bundy Brown and Anne Greeley. Um, I admit she's the, the, ind the individual I probably know the least about. Uh, as with women in the 19th century, it's hard to kind of uh, get um, without papers or without journals or without correspondence as you've written, it's really kind of hard to capture that history. Uh, she was the youngest child, uh, like her brother Philip. Uh, she married into the Clifford family. She actually married Philip's wife's younger brother, um, who was named William. Uh, she was known as Nellie to the family, and uh, she was quite close with her brother John Marshall, uh, who she called Jack. And um, she was just a few, a few years older to her. He wrote to her extensively during the war. So a lot of the letters that we have at Maine Historical Society from John Marshall Brown during the Civil War were written to Ellen, uh, some to his brother Philip, but mostly to, to Ellen. So, you know, they're her papers technically, but unfortunately we don't have the other way around. Um, uh, so we, we learn about, she's, she's got very interest in horses and in flowers and in plants. She's a lot of different friends and activities. She traveled frequently to New York when she was younger, but by all accounts, she was a bit of a homebody after um, she married and um, was just very close to, to her children. In one letter that John Marshall Brown wrote to her, she had uh, talked about how she was interested in getting a photograph of General Adelbert Ames, who was also from Maine. Um, and, uh, and he talks about how they're going to Matthew Brady's studio and then he'll get Matthew Brady to send one to her. So there's some interesting correspondence uh, that's back and well, at least to the one side. Uh, she was educated by private tutors and at Portland High School. Uh, she was a member of St. Luke's Church um, and she led a pretty quiet life. Uh, she married William Henry Clifford in 1866, and um, he was also a lawyer, educated at Dartmouth, and, and worked on Exchange Street and started a firm that his sons carried over, uh, Clifford, Barrel, and Clifford. 
The family lived at 113 Vaughn Street in a house that is historically known as the John Marshall Brown House. So it technically was built by John Marshall Brown. It was uh, in 1867, um, but he only lived there for a couple of years and then he moved out to Falmouth Forsyth and, uh, and then eventually in town to, you know, to State Street. But uh, the house is still known as John Marshall Brown, but the, but the Cliffords lived there for the, the duration and then it eventually when her son dies, it passes to the true family, which is like her niece, nephew situation. So William Clifford and Fanny Clifford, who we already learned about, were the children of Justice Nathan Clifford, who is kind of a, you know, in Maine's Hall of Fame. He was a Supreme Court justice. He's one of the only, one of the few people who's worked in all three of the executive branches, all three of the federal branches of the government. He was uh, a justice. He was in the House of Representatives, and he was also an ambassador to Mexico under Polk during the Mexican War, which is quite a shifty time to be in politics. He was also instrumental in the treaty that, um, that brought California into the United States. And so he's quite a, you know, like I said, kind of a main hall to fame. And a little interesting genealogy tidbit, uh, they're descended from Goody, uh, Goody Cole, who was the only woman in New Hampshire to be accused of witchcraft. So Ellen and William, um, the ch son of, of Nathan Clifford, had uh, six children, Nathan, Matilda, John Brown, William Henry, Ellen, and Philip. So here we have Ellen and William again. This is Nathan Clifford. Uh, he was trained as a lawyer, he worked in the family firm, Clifford Verrill and Clifford. Uh, he was a politician like his grandfather. He was once mayor of Portland, uh, president of the Maine Senate, and he went to Portland High School, Andover, and Harvard. He married Caroline Devins and had three children, Catherine, Nathan, and William Henry Clifford III. Uh, this is Matilda Greeley Clifford, not to be confused with her cousin, Matilda Greeley Brown, uh, who worked around, born around the same time, was born in 1869. I don't know very much about her. She seemed to have a very kind of... Um, European existence. She first married an Englishman who was working as an organist at St. Luke's Church. And then I'm not sure if he passed away or if they divorced, but then she married a Frenchman and she continued to live abroad in England, Belgium, and Italy. So I'm not exactly sure um, what, what happened to Matilda. We have John Brown Clifford and Ellen Eyre Clifford, who um, Unfortunately, both died during, uh, got scarlet fever and both died on the same day in 1880. John Brown Clifford was nine and Ellen was just a year old. And they're both buried in the Brown tomb at Evergreen Cemetery where a lot of the family is buried. Uh, Captain William Henry Clifford was educated at Portland High School at MIT. He went to the, also worked in the firm, but he launched a military career. He was also in the Spanish-American War. I don't have a photograph of him, but this is his marriage certificate, which I find pretty interesting that he got married in London. Uh, he was a Lieutenant in the Navy, and then he joined the United States Marine Corps and he served abroad. He was stationed in the Philippines and in China, sort of right around the, the Philippine insurrection and the, and the war with the Philippines. He, he, although he really lived in Virginia, he maintained um, a, an office and a home here um, and, and worked for the family firm, for, firm, sort of. And then this is Philip Greeley Clifford. So Philip Greeley Clifford's family, which um, has the, is uh, related to the Dana family, uh, is responsible for donating a wonderful set of photo albums that we just acquired at Maine Historical last year and where all the family members are identified, which is amazing. And so a lot of the photographs that we can use in here is because we've been either A, been able to identify who the person is based on the photo albums that were given by Howard Dana, or they came from those photo albums themselves. So it's a really amazing, amazing gift. And this is Philip Greeley Clifford, which is really the line that these passed down. He was uh, educated at Portland High School in Bowdoin. Uh, he studied law at Harvard and eventually joined the family firm. He was active in clubs, uh, Portland Yacht Club, an alumni and fraternity organization. He married Catherine Hale, uh, the daughter of Judge uh, Clarence Hale, and much of the photographs, as I mentioned, were from the Clifford Hale contingency. Uh, they had two daughters, Margaret and Anne, uh, the last of which married Howard Dana. 
So here we are to sort of the last aspect of the family, which is certainly the family that has the closest relationship with Maine Historical Society. And, you know, and I'd like to really thank Larnie Otis for, you know, her continued support as we explore the family and the, and the enormous collection that she's gifted to Maine Historical that really makes presentations like this possible. Uh, John Marshall Brown is, um, I'll try to kind of hit the highlights. There's a lot of information. So, you know, and, 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 but because it's his papers and because it's his wife's papers. So obviously we can learn the most about them from their personal correspondence or what they've collected over time. He was born December 14th, 1838 in Portland. He was educated at Gould Academy and at Andover and also attended Bowdoin as part of the class of 1860. Uh, he uh, studied law at Bowdoin, and uh, in 1862, after he graduated, he enlisted in the U.S. Army um, during the Civil War. Uh, some stories support that he was actually on his way to an event at the Maine Historical Society when he learned the call for soldiers and returned home to enlist. Uh, he enlisted at the rank of First Lieutenant into the 20th Maine of, of Civil War fame in 1862. He served as the adjutant under Colonel Adelbert Ames, who's also from Maine and Bowdoin, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, uh, the latter of which was his former professor. Uh, Chamberlain actually credits John Marshall Brown for his famous haircut, like the mutton chops that, John, that Chamberlain has. John Marshall Brown was Chamberlain's barber when they were in the Civil War and sort of gave him that look. Uh, Brown was in the 20th Maine for one year. So this is a sketch here that we have from one of his books. That was his tent that he stayed in. Uh, he called it his headquarters and he drew this little sketch on December 1st, 1862 while in Virginia. About six months later in June, just days before the Battle of Gettysburg that would sort of like make the 20th famous, he was transferred to serve under Adelbert Ames who had been, um, who had increased in rank to a Brigadier General. And uh, John Marshall Brown was promoted to captain at that time and became the assistant to the Adjutant General for volunteers. So he's sort of in the, um, uh, in the in the Union Army, not no longer in a Maine regiment, uh, but he was only in there for a short period, uh, and then he resigns from that post to to uh, help raise a regiment, the Thirty Second Maine Volunteers. Uh, shortly thereafter, just about four months later, he was um, wounded. He was shot in the left arm and in the side. They thought mortally wounded, but he survived. Uh, although he was honorably discharged, he had, had malaria the year before and really just didn't recover from the wound. He was promoted to Brigadier General by Brevet in 1867, which is sort of was how he gets the name General Brown, which is kind of known for for the rest of his life. So John Marshall Brown married Elida Catherine Carroll. Oops, I have a typo there. And um, and we've uh, so he returns to Portland and he joins the family firm. Uh, he's engaged to Elida, and uh, but she's down in D.C. and he's working for a time as a clerk as per Churchill Browns and Manson, and then he entered into local politics just kind of briefly. Uh, he would remain pretty active in the Maine militia. Uh, he served as the assistant Adjutant general, a proud member of the Loyal Legion, Portland Army and Navy Union, uh, the GAR, and he was instrumental in the establishment of Togus Veterans Hospital. In 1866, Brown would marry his fiance, uh, Elida Catherine Carroll of Washington, DC. Uh, she's part of the DC Maryland Carroll families, which is a very prolific, Maryland family that um, has a lot of relationship to different aspects. It's suburban DC, Washington County, all sorts of the area, like the area of Maryland, which I grew up in. Uh, he met her in the nation's capital. Uh, there's some stories that say that they met when she was riding out in a war zone, but I think it's more likely that they met when John Marshall Brown was visiting his brother's father-in-law. So Justice Nathan Clifford was actually in DC at this time and her father was a clerk to the Supreme Court. And there's, in John Marshall Brown's journals, he mentions that he goes to visit Justice Clifford. So I think that that's how, probably how they met. So um, about um, six months before they get married, there is um, a significant change in the Brown contingency. So this is in July of 1866 with the Great Fire uh, of, of Portland. So Brown wrote to his fiance several letters after this devastating fire on July 4th. And he talks about how his family was impacted 
uh, in that fire. You can see in these photographs here, so sort of just how the Portland Sugar Company was just wiped out. I think most of you probably know, but you know, the, the fire started with some wood shavings adjacent to the Portland to the Sugar Company, and then the Sugar Company just ignited and it kind of went off as a bomb. And uh, John Marshall Brown writes to his, uh, to Elida, that says um, that uh, the next day was Independence Day and in the afternoon, we all went to Glen Cove on a picnic intending to retire early. Just as we were ordering the horse's harness to return, a man came riding up most furiously and shouted, the sugar house is on fire. The excitement passed in a moment and I became perfectly cool and self-possessed and throughout that sad night did not again lose my presence of mind. Phil and I left the ladies at the cove, taking one of the horses, drove into town at a gallop. The news was true, where we reached the scene of the whole immense building was in flames. We saw all that attempts to save it were fruitless and therefore devoted ourselves to that portion of the building where our office and our private papers, money, and other valuables. For five hours, we fought the fire to no purpose. Everything was destroyed. So he was pretty badly hurt in fighting that fire, not, you know, not as bad as it was in the, in the, in the war, but certainly badly hurt. And he goes on to talk about how the magnificent building was entirely consumed and a labor of 25 years blotted out altogether. Father was very cool and collected, although we felt very anxious about his ability to bear the blow. Uh, J.D. Brown lost millions of dollars, millions of dollars in this fire. It was completely devastated. And although he rebuilt the sugar company, by that time, the technology that they were using was really outdated and he just couldn't compete. But fortunately, as I'd mentioned, he had diversified into other aspects and being involved in real estate, obviously both was able to rebuild his city and capitalize on the need for a significant number of new buildings and to really kind of craft the city into what the city is that we know today, um, including the Falmouth Hotel, although it doesn't stand, but sort of that was really the kind of epicenter of the, the rising of the Phoenix as Portland would refer to itself. Uh, we actually have some papers at Maine Historical Society still bundled and singed at the top that they actually saved from that section that they were able to get into, which I think is really amazing. And they still smell like fire. We had those on display for the uh, Fire of 1866 uh, exhibition that Earl Shuttleworth curated a few years ago. So this is Elida with her parents. Uh, Elida was born in Washington, D.C. to William Thomas Carroll and his wife, Sally Sprigg. William Thomas worked as a clerk in the U.S. Supreme Court, as I mentioned. Uh, he was a good friend of um, Abraham Lincoln's, and um, he actually lent Lincoln the family tomb, the Carroll family tomb, when his son died while in the White House. And the Bible that Lincoln swore in on was actually lent to him by William Thomas Carroll, and that's actually still the Bible that the president is sworn in on. And, uh, uh, the, as I mentioned, the, the Carrolls were descended from the immigrant, um, well, they're from the Carroll family. Uh, they were from a particular immigrant line of Charles Carroll, or known as Charles Carroll, Carroll the Settler. Most Carrolls have a jazzy nickname attached to their name because they like to all use the same name over and over again. The two most famous being the signers, Darryl, Daniel Carroll, the signer of the Constitution, and Charles Carroll, the signer of the Declaration of Independence. These Carrolls, our Carrolls, are descended from another line. So there were three cousins that came over. Each signer is from its own branch, and then this is a, a different branch. So all related, but different branches. Uh, this is Violetta Lansdale Sprigg, who is um, the Sally Sprigg's um, mother. Uh, her parents were the uh, 17th governor of Maryland, named Samuel Sprigg and Violetta Lansdale. Uh, Sally Sprigg and William Thomas Carroll were technically half first cousins. Their parents were half siblings, which is pretty common in English nobility, but a little less so in, uh, in the American contingency. And this is Violetta Lansdale Sprigg, who is the mother of Sally Sprigg and is the namesake for the Violetta Lansdales that you see throughout the family uh, for, um, from generations to come. So uh, as mentioned, the Carrolls were members of Washington DC society. They lived in the Northwest. Um, uh, they, uh, they said he was uh, friends of Lincoln's and their daughter actually married uh, close friends of his as well. Um, and so um, the Elida siblings included Violetta Lansdale uh, who married Dr. Thomas Mercer, uh, Samuel Sprigg, who was a civil war general, 
uh, William Thomas Carroll, uh, Charles Carroll was also a Civil War veteran. And then she had two siblings, um, uh, Howard and William, who died young, and a Caroline who actually ended up living in Portland. She was married to a T. Dix Bowles. Uh, there, her sister, uh, this, this is the family home in Washington, D.C., where they lived at 1801 uh, F Street. Uh, her sister, uh, Sally Virginia Carroll, uh, was a noted um, a socialite and the Countess Esther Hazy. And it's a pretty kind of crazy story. She first married one of Lincoln's friends um, and uh, the Charles Griffin, who was at Appomattox. And then she married the Count Esther Hazy after Griffin passed away. In her 70s, she was sued for alienation, uh, alienation of affection. She supposedly stole the 20 something husband from another DC socialite and she was being sued for that. And it was all over the papers. It was, it was um, quite, the, quite the scene. So this is another picture of uh, Elida and John. This is at Thornhurst. Uh, she was born in 1844. Uh, she was uh, the seventh of, um, of, of nine children and she uh, was educated in Ellicott City and she moved him to Portland after their marriage in 1866. Uh, they traveled Europe initially and then uh, eventually they lived at 113 Vaughan as I mentioned and then shortly moved to Falmouth Forsyth. And then they eventually bought a house at 97 State Street this house here. Uh, and uh, all these photographs that I'm showing you of the homes are from the Portland Tax Collection, which is on Main Memory Network. So the couple had five children, Sally, Mary, Elida, Carol, and Violetta. Uh, Sally is here, uh, Brown Payson, was educated at St. Timothy's and uh, in New York and abroad in Germany. She was the oldest child and was the namesake of her grandmother. Um, she was involved in Portland society, the Tate House, Colonial Dames. Uh, she uh, was certainly a woman after her grandmother's heart. She married uh, Herbert Payson. This is them at her younger sister's wedding. Uh, Herbert Payson was the son of Charles Payson and Ann Shipman, a descendant of the Reverend Edward Payson, who was a notable Portland figure. And, and he was um, actually involved in, well, first he was involved in the H.M. Payson and then eventually became director of the P.H. and J.M. Brown uh, Company and enjoyed really a close relationship with his uh, father-in-law. Uh, they had several children, just a few of which are here. Um, they lived at 71 Bowdoin Street, but also built a home at Thornhurst um, and uh, on some property that she had acquired before her father's death. They had six children, Elida, Anne, John Brown, Charles Shipman, Herbert, and Olcott Sprigg. Um, and uh, Elida had married uh, Roger Vinton Snow, uh, Anne Carol Payson, who unfortunately is probably um, remembered for uh, her brutal uh, murder in 1976 in the Thornhurst neighborhood during a botched home invasion, which actually set um, precedent, a uh, court precedent, um, to uh, differentiate between manslaughter and murder. So it's a, a case um, on the books for that reason. Uh, John Brown Payson, who moved to Washington, DC, uh, who died tragically after long illness, uh, who married Elizabeth Palmer, and then Charles Shipman Payson, which is probably the most, um, uh, most remembered for his patronage of the Portland Museum of Art, who married Joan Whitney, and uh, he inherited the Mets baseball team for that. He married second of uh, Virginia Craft after the death of his first wife. Uh, Herbert Payson was a main politician. He established, um, he was pretty established in the Thornhurst neighborhood area, and he was also a member of the family firm. And of course, the Portland Country Club. And then their youngest, Olcott Sprague, was killed in World War II, uh, and his wife, Anne, Anne Barton, died shortly after. So this is Elida Greeley Brown. Uh, I think most of you probably associate with St. Mary's and found with Forside. Uh, she was born in 1870. Uh, she was educated also at St. Timothy's, and as a teenager, she studied art in Europe, where she died in Switzerland in 1889, at the age of 18. Uh, her cause of death, I think, was typhoid fever, but because you can't bring, uh, or her parents really desperately tried to get her body brought back to the United States, and you cannot bring a body back at this time that had died from an infectious disease. And so I think that the first, the death certificate was changed to show perforation of the bowels, uh, of which a symptom was fever, uh, because they tried for, for about six years to bring her back and were finally able to do so. Uh, while they were trying to bring her back, to Maine, uh, they erected St. Mary's Chapel on the foreside uh, in her memory. 
Um, like I said, because of quarantine laws, it took a really long time. Uh, but uh, finally, she was brought back aboard the ship Vancouver in 1895 and was interred at St. Mary's sometime during the week of April 9th, 1895. Uh, John Marshall Brown uh, and his wife, Elida, are also buried in the family crypt. So here are some early photographs uh, of the church. That, um, uh, Mary Brewster Brown, uh, who is actually the, the younger of the two on the, on the side with a little bow tie there, um, known as Molly, was John and Elijah's third child, educated at St. Timothy's. She married Dr. Strong Derby, George Strong Derby, excuse me, um, the son of Haskett Derby and Sarah Manson uh, Mason in 1901. Uh, he was a Harvard-trained uh, um, ophthalmologist and um, they, uh, were, their wedding was quite, quite the hit of Boston society. Uh, it took place at St. Mary's and uh, she was a charming bride in white taffetas and voluminous veil of tulle. Uh, Dr. Derby's family was from Boston and then the Derby's lived there until Dr. Derby's death in 1931. Uh, Molly died a short time after in 18, 1934 uh, at the house on Thornhurst. Uh, she was very active in the American Red Cross during World War I and was even decorated by the Italian government for her service. Uh, the couple had four children, Haskett Derby, Mary Brewster, uh, also known as Bootsy, uh, two young children, uh, Olka and Sally, who died in infancy, and they maintained the family home at, yeah. um, So uh, Carol Brown is the son. Um, So Carol Brown was the only son of John Marshall Brown and educated at the Fay School in St. In Paul's and at Harvard for a few years. Uh, he was in the World War I and then afterward had kind of a litany of different jobs and activities. He was a chicken farmer for a while. He was involved in mining in Colorado. He was involved in all sorts of different kind of uh, activities and social clubs. As far as I can tell, he was never involved in the family business and didn't maintain a home at Thornhurst. Uh, although he was one of his father's trustees, I don't think he had a really close relationship uh, with the Browns. He moved to Florida uh, in the 1930s. Uh, he did uh, marry uh, Amanda Juneman uh, and, uh, in Colorado in 1877, and, um, and they had two children, uh, John Bundy Brown II and Patty Field Brown. Uh, and they, uh, I think they also had a young daughter who died as an infant. The, John Bundy Brown was uh, on the professional golf circuit, and his sons are also uh, a, quite a few collections to Maine Historical Society. And so here's a picture of Carol. We just have some pictures of him when he's a kid, and that's with his sister Violetta. So Violetta Lansdale Brown is the last of the children, and this sort of kind of goes into where I'll close about Thornhurst. Uh, she's, she's really kind of the steward of the Thornhurst kind of memory and legacy. Uh, although the family trustees all was involved in the estate of John Marshall Brown, it really was Violetta that kind of carried the history. She was the youngest and I think the favorite of her, um, her father, John Marshall Brown, and was educated at St. Timothy's, of course. Uh, she, uh, she married Harold Lee Berry um, in, 18, oh, in 1905. Uh, Harold Berry, this is a picture of her when she's young. This is her picture from her wedding, and there's their wedding, and that's her mother, Elida. I, I, this is all at Thornhurst. Uh, Harold Lee Berry was the son of Alfred Berry and Francis uh, Crosby, a notable family from the Midcoast area. Uh, he worked in the family business of A.H. Berry Shoes and was involved in local politics. He was a Bowdoin grad and of an avid Bowdoin supporter. We have lots of Bowdoin material from Harold Lee Berry here at Maine Historical. Uh, Violetta, Violetta was quintessential lady who lunched. She was involved in all sorts of society activities, Tate House, Mount Vernon, DAR, Colonial Dames, Red Cross, YMCA, you name it, she was involved in it. And they had two daughters, Martha, who married James Neals, and Violetta, who married first Jack Spencer, and then second James Otis. So this family really serves as the stewards for the collection that came to Maine Historical Society. Violetta, at least to the best of my knowledge, really served as the family historian, was very interested in that, like her father. She also wrote poetry, and she's kind of interested in those same things. And um, in her father's will, uh, so here's who she is with her two daughters. So in her father's will, uh, that both she and her sister Molly could choose property as long as it was agreed upon by the trustees. And unfortunately, the trustees were all their husbands, their brother, and their mother. So they each kind of got a piece of Thornhurst. Sally Payson had sort of already been established. 
Um, and Carol, I, to the best of my knowledge, just whether either wasn't interested or just just wasn't. I mean, he was a trustee, but he just didn't seem to to kind of break that piece off. But um, Thornhurst, as as most of you know, was a, a farm that was owned by John Marshall Brown and Elida Carol Brown um, out in Falmouth Forsyth. So it was a working farm. It was a gentleman's farm, but it was a working farm. And um, at the time of his death, the building the still it still stood. And just like kind of Bram Hall, you see all these different pieces of land were being bought up over time to create this, this, this farm, this estate. And then uh, right before John Marshall Brown's death, you start to see the pieces kind of break off, much in the way that John Bundy Brown did, where he kind of broke the pieces off for different members of the family. And you start to see that breaking down. And then he, um, he sets up a, a, a company, like a land holding company, that as far as I can tell, Herbert Payson was sort of you know, kind of the the, the, the spearheaded that and, um, and, and sort of uh, breaks those off to become what is the Bram Hall Field so that, you know, and the, um, uh, the Portland Country Club. And so John Marshall Brown sort of sets up this land holding company and then it continues after his death. Uh, it was built by John Marshall Brown. I don't know the architect. I think maybe it was, uh, uh, Nick had mentioned that it was maybe Francis Fassett, but we do know that John Calvin Stevens worked on the home extensively in the 1880s. Uh, he periodically bought up land and you can see this from this photograph. Um, and uh, roughly from the stretch of Route 1 in 88, the Bram Hall Field, Portland Country Club, and to what's the Thornhurst neighborhood, Waits Landing area. Here's some photographs of different members of the family at Thornhurst. Unfortunately, the house doesn't stand, but it was really a summer home. I mean, I suspect, you know, it can't all last. And so um, I know you probably can't really see this very well, but this is kind of a map that Larnie Otis had, had lent to me that reveals some of the plots and it puts them to name. And then Ted Noyes did this really great kind of step-by-step um, -step of the history of the Portland Country Club and all the different land. And it really kind of highlights like all the different pieces that had to kind of be plugged in to create Thornhurst. And then all the pieces that get pulled out to create the Falmouth Foresight area that we know today. And so you can see a little bit these you can see Sally Payson on the side there, and then you can see this is kind of the bottom closer to the water and the pieces. So John Bundy Brown was involved in this and had sold some to his son, and then different members uh, of the community and different names. And then here's one that's a little bit more modern that you can see Portland Country Club at the top, Thornhurst Farm Incorporated, and then in the middle you have Violetta's um, older daughter, and then towards the bottom, which is really kind of hard to see is Violetta's uh, younger daughter, which is where, um, you know, sort of closer to the ocean down there. And then the last here we'll say, um, you know, Bram Hall and Thornhurst in these ways, I sort of kind of anchor the talk in there, the, the gates for Bram Hall, actually I believe at Thornhurst. And they sort of, both of the John Bundy Brown and John Marshall Brown really having that, um, you know, that sense about buying the land, uh, piecing together, uh, amalgamating the land and bringing it all together, you know, enjoying it by having these, these you know, these large estates where their families and, and their friends could enjoy themselves and then, um, then breaking the pieces out and developing them in a way to help sustain, you know, the future generations of his family. So I think it really kind of neatly ties the story and those pieces together and really anchors the story of the Browns. So to the end of the presentation, I apologize, I went over a little bit, tried to and hope I didn't talk too fast. Um, and we'll close out with a, uh, a, a photograph of the Browns and two of their friends uh, in, in that piece there. I'll turn it over to you, Steve, or? Yeah, Jamie, thank you. That was wonderful. There's so much, it's such a sprawling family that's had impact in so many ways. And there's so much wonderful information and stories and tidbits. Um, so thank you for just such a, a nice orientation. Uh, clearly, folks, there's so many avenues one can go down. And I know many of you or a number of you have connections to the Brown family. So as you're curious about family history and connections and stories about some of these people, um, I know Jamie would be happy to uh, engage you in conversation. I just want to say thank you again so much for your, your interest in the Brown family, your support for Maine Historical Society. As I said, I know we all have different angles and connections to the Browns and Thornhurst in the West End, um, just reach out with stories or questions. We'd be happy to continue the conversation in that way. Uh, and just thank you again so much for coming. Um, again, we hope you stay healthy and well as the pandemic plays on and we get to Christmas and May 2021 
really be a, a wonderful kickoff to Maine's third century. So thank you all so much and have a good evening.